Praise the Lord, everybody. Would you stand this morning? Hey, man, we have a little bit of time this morning. Let's walk around, greet one another. Maybe you haven't seen each other since last Sunday. Maybe last Wednesday, greet one another. Welcome to the house of the Lord. You're here today and tonight? What? I don't know how else you might meet Praise the Lord. Let's read just a portion of scripture this morning on my heart. It said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth, listen to some of these benefits that uh, David was talking about. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies the mouth with good things so that the youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Amen. Those are some great benefits, God, that God gives his church. Aren't you thankful for God's benefits? Let's take a minute this morning to just thank him for his goodness and his mercy. Would you love him? Hallelujah. Savior, we love you. We worship. We adore you, God. Hallelujah. We've come today to give you glory, to give you honor today. Hallelujah. Let's sing with all of our hearts today. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Yes. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. to celebrate celebrate in the presence of the Lord he is worthy to be praised we'll celebrate in the presence of the Lord he is worthy to be praised this is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it this is the day that the Lord has made will I will rejoice and be glad in it Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I come to rejoice. Lord, 
with all your heart. Magnify his holy name. Well, then, sing it to the Lord with all your heart. Magnify his holy name. Sing it to the Lord with all your heart. Magnify his holy name. Magnify His holy name. We'll celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Come on, celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Oh, yes. I come to rejoice. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord, he's reigning. I'm going to rejoice. Well, this is the day that the Lord, hallelujah. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Yeah. His holy name, singing to the Lord with all your heart, magnify His holy name. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. the Lord with all your heart magnify his holy name. I came today I came today to sing unto the Lord magnify his holy name sing unto the Lord with all your heart magnify his holy name sing unto the Lord with all your heart magnify his holy name well, this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. With all your heart, magnify His holy name. Sing to the Lord with all your heart. Yes. Magnify His holy name. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Listen to what Paul said, Philippians 4 and 4, it said, Rejoice in the Lord, always. It doesn't matter if we're up, it doesn't matter if we're down. It said, always. Rejoice. And then he goes on just to, just kind of to emphasize his, his, what he was saying. He says, again, again, I say rejoice. I don't know about you, friend, but I would much rather rejoice and be mourning somewhere. I want to rejoice for what God has done for me. I want to rejoice for what God is going to do for us. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Verse today. Sing it to the Lord with all your heart. Magnify his holy name. Sing it to the Lord with all your heart. Magnify his holy name. Sing 
magnify his Oh, it feels good in the house today. Celebrating the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to be Come on, celebrate. Celebrate in the presence of the Lord. He is worthy to Oh, yes. This is the day that the Lord has made. And be glad in it. Rejoice in the Lord. It's a good day to rejoice. in the house today. Uh, I said it feels good in the house today. I believe it's time to rejoice. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe it's time to give God glory and honor and praise for all that he's done, for all that he's going to do. And it's time to get to clapping. Yes. This is why I dance. This is why I rejoice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 David said that pretty well at the end of his uh, book of Psalms there. Whenever he began to talk about everything, praising the Lord on the cymbals, the drums, and everything. And he finally just sums it up just in case he had missed something. Let that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Amen. I believe he is worthy of it. I said I believe that he is worthy of it. And I'm going to do my very best to give him glory and honor today. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated for a few moments this morning. Amen. It's so good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Feel in his presence. I do feel the Holy Ghost uh, this morning. Please forgive me. My uh, one of the after effects of the COVID deal is my throat has nowhere near what it used to be. And my air, I turned around and asked Larissa, is there an oxygen tank back there somewhere <laughs> that I can take a few breaths? But uh, anyway, that's one of the things in a runny nose, huh, Sister Susie? Those are some of the things that just linger on. But anyway, I'm here and I feel good in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's what's important. Just want to take a few moments this morning. And uh, we have still pretty early and just say a couple of things this morning. So grateful, so thankful for all the help that was here yesterday. Had such a good turn up. Brother Robert Spector shaking his head. And I know he appreciates all the men coming out. We got a tremendous amount of work done yesterday. And it was because of your faithfulness. It was because of uh, you willing to come down and get it done. And uh, we just appreciate that so much. It's going to make such a difference in our, our curb appeal. And that's what we're wanting to do to the city is just to present a little bit different image of our church. We want to make it to look presentable and look nice. And we're not doing it for our glory or our honor, but it's all because of God. And, man, and that's what we want to happen. And then just want to say a real quick thank you to Sister Morgan and uh, Sister Kayla. They did a tremendous job. <laughs> tremendous job. Looks so good. They were here late last night till about 9 o'clock, making it presentable and make it look nice. And, uh, of course, we've done this around the house, too. I've told my wife and some of these the same thing. There's only one bad thing about decorating for Christmas. When you take it down, it looks so blah. <laughs> when you take it. Sister Leslie, I would encourage everybody, if you have Sister Leslie uh, as a uh, uh, a friend on Facebook, go on and find her post, how to decorate when you have pests, pets, not pests, sometimes they're pests, but pets. I laughed, Sister Leslie, yesterday I had tears running down my eyes when I saw the one with a vacuum cleaner in front of, in front of the uh, Christmas tree to keep the cat away because cats hate vacuum cleaners, mine does. She takes off running and hiding every time we bring it out, but I laughed till I cried, so thank you for a good laugh yesterday, it was great. But anyway, we're grateful for all the work that was accomplished and everything that was done. God bless you for being faithful and working for the Lord. Amen. Then also, uh, the youth, the ones that are going on the trip, they're going to be selling nachos tonight. It's for $8, including drinks and cookies. So come and support uh, Jackie and Abby and be a blessing to them. $8 is the price of that. It'll be right after church tonight. And then also... Just our announcements are the same this week. We'll not spend a lot of time Tuesday morning prayer for men, Wednesday Bible study, Thursday night ladies prayer. And then also our Christmas for Christ envelopes usually. Uh, we have them by now, and uh, we don't want you to forget about those things. Uh, they will be coming to us. Brother Bodie said that they called him from the office, the main office there in Missouri, and said for some reason our envelopes were returned back to them, and they said they were not deliverable. Uh, so we don't know exactly what happened, but if anything, we'll, we'll get them taken care of. We'll get them in, or if nothing else, we'll just put them in the envelopes and mark them Christmas for Christ. Amen. But we want it to be in the back of your mind that we're wanting to take care of those things uh, coming down the road. And it be a blessing. Last year, you did a tremendous job on your giving, and uh, God appreciates that always. Amen. Many things that are going on, it seems like... I told Brother Bodie at the beginning of November, I said, pretty soon uh, we're going to know that uh, the end of the year, uh, December is going to be here upon us so quick because there's so many things that are going on and happening. 
Praise the Lord. I do want to take another moment to, uh, Brother Bodie said we don't have to turn it to him at 10 to 15 or 10 20, so I'm taking a little bit of time. I hope that you don't mind. But I want to say uh, I'm thankful f- to have been able to have a chance to get away. And uh, there are several of you that have come and welcomed me home, and I appreciate that so very much. There's no place like home, and that holds so true, not just for where you live, but also for your church. I was able to go with, to church with my mom, and uh, we had a good time there at her church last Sunday, and I enjoyed that very much. But it's just not the same as being home. But I want to say all that to say this, and I know Brother Jaime and Sister Leanne just went on a lengthy trip and drive. I'm not sure how many miles they drove. But when I pulled back in town, uh, my car said that I had drove 4,048 miles. Did you drive more, Brother Hyman? Did you? Well, that's, a, that's a whole lot of traveling on the road. But I started home. I try to, when I leave from the point of where I'm leaving from, I try not to ever let it enter my mind how far I've got to go. I just say, okay, this is how far I've got to get today, and then I'll have part of that done and taken care of. But I left my mom's last Tuesday morning at quarter. And I'm telling this because I believe it was the glory of God that helped me and the power of God. But anyway, I left about quarter to seven last Tuesday morning from her house. And it was that I hadn't drove two blocks and I had to go across a train track. And it was one of the longest trains I have ever set before. It's 15 minutes uh, that I sit there. I just put the car in park and just begin to look at my phone for a few minutes and update myself on some news and and just read because there was nothing I could do. There's no way that you can go around it, so you just have to sit there and wait. But as I (laughs) waited longer and longer, my patience was wearing thin, and I was getting upset and and aggravated, and and all I could think about is I've got 2,000 miles to go, and I'm sitting here uh, just idly when I could be driving down the road at 65, 70 mile an hour. And uh, so uh, finally they left, and I went on, never thought much more about it. But I got into Arkansas. It was probably about uh, 40, 50 miles west of where Little Rock is. Brother Jaime has been through there before. He knows what I'm talking about, and I know you do. But anyway, it was on Highway 40, one of the main uh, uh, highways between uh, Los Angeles, really, or Barstow, California, all the way to North Carolina. But uh, it, it was, there wasn't a lot of traffic, but I began to notice it began to slow down, and it was that uh, there was one of the most horrible car wrecks I have ever seen in my life. I told him it looked like someone had taken a, a can opener and opened the passenger side of the car and just lifted all, uh, all the way up. I don't know, they maybe had the jaws of life there to get them out, but it was horrible. There was par- car parts all over the highway. And I began to think back to that 15 minutes. And it's very well possible that I could have been right there when that thing was going on. I'm sure that there were other cars. There was still a semi there that was parked. And you could tell there was some damage to the semi. But I'm sure because of the parts of the car that were all over the road. And I have a picture of it on my phone if you'd like to see it. But uh, I'm sure that there were other cars involved. And all I could then it hit me. That's where your 15 minutes was at. And I said, thank you, Lord, you kept your hand on me again. God's so good to us. Who knows how many times. So I was telling somebody about it the other day, and and somebody said, I wonder how many times God thinks up there. He sees us getting impatient, waiting for the train. And he's thinking all along, if you only knew why I'm doing this for you. Amen. And I say, thank you, Lord, today for keeping your hand upon me. God's so good to us, church. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. We want to take just a couple of uh, now, uh, uh, prayer requests today. We want to pray for uh, Tim, brother. Elmo was here working yesterday. He got a call that Tim was having difficulty breathing again, so uh, he ran off to take care of him and see about him. But we do want to continue to pray for him, that God will completely touch him. And then also, Brother Jose is dealing with asthma and a cough, and uh, we want to pray for him, that God would touch him. Brother Jared is still uh, is under the weather. Uh, Sister Laura is not feeling well. And then continue to pray for Brother Gomes. Amen. Let's take just a minute to pray for these needs. Brother Jose, Brother Jared, Sister Laura, Tim Gonzalez, and Brother Gomes. Would you take a minute this morning to pray? Savior, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you, God, all that you do for us. We're asking today, God, that you would move in our hearts and lives. 
lives, believing with all of our heart that you're the great physician. There has never been a doubt in our minds, God. We're asking you to touch all these needs today. Touch him, God, in Jesus' name. Do the complete healing that is needed there. Hallelujah. Brother Gomes, bless our brother, God. Hallelujah. Touch him today. Brother Jose, in Jesus' name, touch Sister Laura. Hallelujah, God. Give these strength, Lord, that they need to be here. Touch Jared today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we want you to move, God. We want you to have your way. We love you. We thank you. We appreciate you today, God. Amen. We're going to sing another good course before we turn our service over to Pastor. Amen. And hear what God has laid upon his heart today. We're just singing to the Lord. pastor's wife back in Texas this week she made the mention that you know after a good Sunday night service many times a lot of the young people different ones will go out eat after church 
and um, said in doing that, sometimes they have favorite places that they would go to often. Um, obviously, it's not Dinu because we don't have that many places that time of night on Sunday evening. But it was in the Houston area. You know Sister um, Shara McKee. She said they, you know, they laugh, they cut up, they have a good time. She said as they were leaving the restaurant the other day, she handed their waitress uh, one of their business cards and invited them to church, invited her to church. Said that waitress handed it back to her. And uh, Shara was a little, you know, didn't know what to expect. And so that waitress sat there and said, why have you not invited me before? She said, I have been waiting on you week after week and wanting to come to your church. Why have you not invited me before? It's powerful, folks. We don't know how many people out there looking at us wanting what we have and they just need a friend and um, so help us God help us to to reach out and touch this world help us to live magnetic lives help us to live lives that they want to emulate be like be a part of and to get to know the God that we have amen praise God praise God well, thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody, everything that has been done, um, all this work that is in here that so makes it so pretty. Uh, was not a little magical fairy doing it, but um, it was hard work, and I appreciate that. Brother Robert, my hat's off to you. Um, he had things to get done yesterday, and he worked late anyway got up early this morning, got back out there on that track hoe and, um, or mini excavator, whatever it is, and worked again. And I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Chris Zuniga. You've been doing tremendous um, leading the project as far as from the church with, with the landscaping. And um, I appreciate all of it so so much appreciate what is being done it takes it takes a, a team it takes a body it takes a family to get things done majorly done around the house of god we are going to let me just throw this out we are going to have to do some work in the uh, kitchen uh, next door shortly we found out some the tiles are popping up off the concrete so uh, I need your ladies' opinions. We can't obviously do it right now, but we're going to have to do it quickly so before long after the first of the year because those red tiles are starting to pop up. Now, I don't know which one of you poured acid on it to make it do it. Pastor, can I say one thing I forgot? Oh, you know who did it? <laughs> no. Oh. I wanted to say this morning, I hope that you, whenever you drive by over there, that you look at the dumpster a trailer that we have bought, that you have bought. And I just wanted to say it's because of your faithfulness we were able to go out and purchase this uh, trailer that now we're, uh, nobody has to lift it out, this stuff out of there. It just automatically it'll lift it up and dump that. And I want to say it's because of your faithfulness and your giving that we were able to do that. Thank you so much. The funny thing is this. We were having a big time debate yesterday. It's full. And we were having a big time debate yesterday on who gets to go the first time to dump it, <laughs> dump it at the dump to watch it go the first time. So it's still kind of, we may have three or four to go that one day just to stand there and watch it. <laughs> they asked me, they said, said, you want us to go to the dump? I said, no, I think Brother O'Brien wants to go. <laughs> He wants to see that thing get emptied out without his fingers having to do anything but hit a button. Amen. Praise God. Are you ready for the word of the Lord? Let's stand together in honor of the word of God.
praise God. Some traditions I don't want to ever get out of, but I don't want you to forget the reason we do it either. I want you to, I want you to always have the greatest respect for the Word of God and uh, cherish that. When, when a guest preacher's here and he starts reading his text and you pop to your feet, it just makes me a, a happy pastor that you show that kind of love for the Word of God. Amen. Luke chapter 3, I want to take you down to the last two verses in that chapter. This is the lineage of Jesus. Uh, this particular one is, is shown through the lineage of Joseph, which was not his biological father, we do realize. But there are some things here that I want to pull out. Verse 37, now this is, this is backing into this lineage which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malil, which was the son of Canaan. Verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. Anybody know where I'm at now? Which was the son of God, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now let me take you to the book of John, and I want to read one verse of Scripture just to confuse you real good, okay? Because we've, we get up here and we tell you that the Word of God has no contradictions to it, and it doesn't. But you know, have to know how to put the things together. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his only begotten son. But Luke said that Adam was the son of God. I want to talk to you tonight, or this morning, about sonship. Just simply sonship. Pray with me that the Holy Ghost will help me to communicate. Jesus, I love you and I thank you for dropping this into my heart. And uh, I pray that I can do the justice to it that it deserves. Pray that you would grant to me the fluidity of thought. Uh, the rapidity of words. I pray, God, that you would give me, and through the Holy Ghost, a unique anointing. I pray for the spirit of revelation to flow through this house. I pray for a confidence in the Holy Ghost to come to some people. In the name of Jesus, and we glorify you and we praise you in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> Sonship. I think it's very important that we move beyond just this concept of being unworthy, constantly feeling like we're not good enough, feeling like we make uh, mistakes so much that we're living in fear that God's just going to bump us off and send us to. Hades for the la least little infractions. Hello, somebody. And a walk into a confidence of a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Very important that we get this understanding of sonship into our, into our spirits. Now, I want to read another verse of Scripture to back up what I just read to you in in uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16, and this is in the book of 1 John chapter nine, 4 and verse 9. It says much of the same, for in this manifested, uh, was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. And so this concept of the only begotten son when at the same time 
we read the scripture and the scripture calls Adam the son of God. So we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take these two things and we're going to merge them together and we're going to show you something and then I'm going to carry it a little further than that. We're going to go back right now into the book of Genesis when God began to deal with uh, Abraham and uh, he spoke to Abraham and told Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son. Anybody remember this? Your only son. God specified to Abraham that he was to take his only son, Isaac. He said, whom you lovest and get thee to the land of Moriah. What we're going to see here is we're going to see the foreshadowing of the story of the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see that. We're going to see the, the uh, foreshadowing of the cross. We're going to see the foreshadowing of that. Actually, uh, history tells us, archaeologists tells us, that the mount that, the, that Isaac was taken to uh, in the land of Moriah is also called the Mount of Sacrifice. And it was supposed to be the same place that David offered the sacrifice uh, when Arana offered him the threshing floor. Another name for it is called Golgotha. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Calvary. And so, so we're seeing the strong foreshadowing of this storyline playing out. God's going to send uh, Abraham, and he's going to take his son, his only son, Isaac, and he's going to offer him on that mountain as a sacrifice. Of course, uh, we, we know the story. Most of us know it very, very well, that, that he is going to get up there, and it's going to be stopped because God is not into human sacrifices. And besides that, Isaac would never be perfect enough to be the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Sin did demand death, but it had to be a sinless life that could overcome death, hell, and the grave, that could overcome the curse of sin. You couldn't offer an imperfect sacrifice and expect God to accept it as that which would fulfill the law that said sin had to be covered by sinless blood. Isaac would never have been sufficient. There's only one that would ever be sufficient. But God stopped the hand of Abraham and said, Now I know that you love me. I know you love me more than you love Isaac. But when you read the text and you read how that God said, I want you to take your only son. Now, if you've read the word of God at all, you know, like I know, that Abraham had a previous son. And uh, his name is Ishmael. And Ishmael is still causing trouble to this day. If you'd ever think about it, you've got, a, you've got a tiny little land called Israel that they have to split up and divide with a bunch of Philistines that are in there still trying to encroach, destroy, take over. Uh, they don't even want the UN. What does the UN have any business in the government uh, governance of, of the state of Israel, but they want the UN has decided that Israel should never call the Temple Mount by Israeli names. It should be called by the, the uh, Islamic names and the Arab names. Now, what right do they have to go in there and tell a government what they've got to call a mountain or a place where a temple is? It's because they hate Israel. They despise Israel. They are still trying to kill Israel. Hang on to this because I'm going somewhere with it. And if you haven't felt the Holy Ghost yet, I do. It's like one of those times I got enough anointing for both of us. You just hang on just a little bit. Because Ishmael was not born or the result of the promise of God that God gave to Abraham and to Sarah that he was going to give them a son. That was not done uh, in promise. It was done through uh, somebody in doubt. 
not believing that God said what he meant what he said. But I want to tell you something today, and I'm fixing to get happy and start getting loud, and I'm trying to keep that down because I want to preach tonight and I want to have a little voice. But listen to me because I want you to understand that when God says something, he will bring it to pass. God's word is life. It is, it is in him there is no time. God knows tomorrow just like it was yesterday. And God knows what's going to take place. You don't need to manipulate the promises of God and get it into your own hands. It's not your business. It's God's business. Sarah, through her unbelief, said, well, maybe you need to do it with my maid and maybe that's how god is going to fulfill this we haven't had kids it's never happened and so obviously we've misunderstood god god was wrong about that god's never wrong folks never wrong do not try to fulfill in the flesh a word that god has given to you in the spirit oh i'm in the holy ghost right now I'm feeling it right now. There's promises that have been given to you and to this church. And if you ever step ahead of God and try to fulfill it in your flesh, you want to do it, you want it so bad, you desire it so bad, and so you try to make it happen. It's, it's going to cause you problems when you try to manipulate the hand and the will of God. So Ishmael was born. But God never recognized Ishmael because Ishmael was born of the flesh. He was not born of the promise or the spirit. He was born of the flesh. And so the time came uh, when finally, even though their bodies were, the scripture considered them dead. Somebody shout it, dead. It didn't. It, 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 they still got to the place they understood. Ishmael was a mistake. Ishmael was not the promise. Ishmael is not the son that God recognizes. <laughs> is it okay I shout over theology? I get excited about this stuff, folks. Because the implications of it is so real and so deep. So you have this. It's always causing problems. Let me tell you what happens. Your stinking flesh will always try to kill, destroy the spirit that God wants to bring out. Because the promise is through the spirit, not through your flesh. Now, now let's go back into the book of Genesis to, to, to take care of this matter about Adam being the son of God. God created the heavens and the earth and all that was in it. He created all of those things, and then he created man. And that man he called Adam. That was a son product of God. He had no earthly father. He had no earthly mother. He was the product or the son of God. But here's the problem. When faced with temptation, Adam could not handle it. He wanted the flesh he wanted Eve so bad that he, rather than trusting God to take care of that issue, he succumbed to temptation to keep what he had in the flesh. Oh, God, help me today. 
because I'm fixing, I'm fixing to get down there where it gets real because I'm fixing to talk about your walk with God and your relationship with God and I want to know, are you going to pursue the things of the flesh more than you pursue the things of the Spirit? Adam, the same God that gave you a deep sleep and took out of your side a rib and created Eve can do it again if he has to. That wasn't the only rib you had, Adam. Instead of trusting God and obeying God, Adam gave in to the flesh. When he did that, sin entered into the world. And you hear me, God never did consider Adam that son that was promised. Never did. Just like the typology that was there in Abraham's story, even though there was one, that was biologically born earlier. Sonship in the eyes of God is not dictated merely by fleshly prodigy. It is dictated by the one who obeys, fulfills the will of the Father. First mm, mm, mm. Corinthians verse 15, uh, chapter 15. Verse 45, and the whole context is beautiful, but it says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The one became a living body. The second one had a different dimension about him, and it wasn't just the flesh. It was the spirit that is inside of him. Let me just remind you, precious people, that we are not going to live forever on this earth. I know they lived a long, long time back then, but we're not going to live forever on this earth. What we are going to do is we are going to be that which we cannot see. This body is going to put off this coil of flesh. It is going to take on immortality, and we are going to live forever, not in the flesh, but we are going to live in the spirit. So what we're after in sonship is not just this body, but we are after the soul and the spirit that we ought to be. We need to be transformed in the spirit. Mm. Hear me now. Abraham, Sarah were so old People said it couldn't happen, and it can't happen in the eyes of men. But the impossible is a platform for God to perform miracles. <laughs> because it never was about your flesh. It may have been that they were at the place where their flesh had passed over any potential and possibility of that. It was dead. But God said, I'll take that which is dead and I'll give it life and it will produce the promise that I want it to have. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? I'm telling you that there's power in sonship when you get into that place with God. Let's go on. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. How be it? That which was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards, that which is spiritual. Talk about us. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. That, my friend, is what we want to be. Your natural birth is not what makes you a son of God. It is your new birth that makes you a son of God. It is your spiritual birth. It's when you're born again of the water 
and of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can a man enter into his mother's womb and be born again, thinking through the flesh? God said, if you're going to ever see the kingdom of God, if you're ever going to understand, comprehend the kingdom of God, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. I'm here to tell you today, if you're going to go to heaven, I, you're going to have to go the way that the Scripture says. It's still going to be a death, a burial, and a resurrection. It's going to be that you repent of your sins, you're baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of those sins, and you're going to have to receive the infilling of God's Spirit inside of you if you're ever going to be a son of God. Beloved, now it doth not appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him. Mm. He's wanting to make us sons of God, joint heirs of the promise. <laughs> now, I want to I show you a little trivial thing that may not mean a whole lot to some people. We just pass over some things. You'll, you'll notice in the Hebrew there are two words, and they basically mean the same thing. Uh, bar, barjona, you'll, you'll, you'll notice it's, it talks about Barjona. It means son of Jonas. You with me there? Bar means son. Barabbas means the son of Abbas. Uh, and on and on like that. You'll see that in there. Uh, but there's another one that means basically the same thing with a little twist to it. And that is when it, the, the three letters are not B-A-R, but it's B-E-N, Ben, instead of bar. When it has that preface, prefix of, of Ben in front of it instead of bar, you are not just talking about a son but you are talking about your designated heir that is going to inherit from you. you. You remember how that Rachel was there at the side of the road in labor, and she is in pain, and she names her son, and she gives him a horrible name that basically means son of my troubles and things like that. But, 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 but the, the daddy comes along and he says, no, 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 it's not going to happen around my house because I am not going to let him be the son of trouble, but he is going to be Benjamin, which is going to be the son of my right hand. He is my heir. I have lost Joseph and I am going to skip over every one of them that predated him and I'm going to make the latter greater than the first and I'm going to make him mine. Let me tell you what I am wanting. I'm not just wanting to be a son of God in the fact that I'm a human being, but I want to be an inheritor. I want to be the heir of the promises of God that God is going to open up his arms and say, enter in thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to be one that sells my inheritance and goes out and squanders it in this world. I want to be the one that stays in the house and takes care of the Father's business. Woo! Sonship in the Scripture is not predicated just on your birth, but it is predicated on on your relationship. Now, in the scripture, I'm going to pass through this fairly rapidly here, I think. In the scripture, when it, in the New Testament, when it talks about sons, there are actually three particular words that are used when it talks about sons, just like in the, in the Hebrew, there's ben and bar. In the New Testament, there is three words that describe this, and it is stages of sonship. 
Say that with me. Stages of sonship. I, we put out a picture the other day. Have you seen the picture of my grandson? If you haven't, come talk to me. As a matter of fact, no, I'm kidding. But uh, uh, we put out a, a picture the other day of me sitting on the couch. Dar, uh, Dustin is, is uh, tucked underneath my arm, and in his arms is Dawson. And so we've got three generations, Daddy, Dustin, and, da and Dawson, and uh, we, we, we're sitting there. Now, Dustin is my son. Dawson is his son. And there is, there is that lineage that is there. Boy, it feels great to have another Bodie in the world. But I'm not turning the checkbook over to either Darby, I mean Dustin, or Dawson right now. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Yes, Dustin is my son. But I'm not handing him all of my business yet. Come a day, he's going to have to take care of it. But today ain't the day. Okay? Now, it's a lot better than it used to be. I mean, if he had to today, I'd, get, I'd give it to him today. You all understand that. Because he's not out there on drugs. He's not going to squander it. He's not going to go out there and abuse it and waste it. I've got the confidence that he's going to take care of those things. He's proving himself to me. Watch this. The, in the scripture, the first word for a son is nephos. And in that particular word, it is basically talking about an infant. An infant. And that infant, obviously, is not ready for responsibility. It's just, it's not there. He can't even, he can't even hold a pencil right now, let alone si forge my name to something. He can't do that kind of stuff. Yeah, this is, I know, this is ABCs with blocks. It's like, duh, that's the course. Bible says we're going to learn line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. But folks, if you ever take certain precepts out of that, that whole thing is going to collapse. And there's some things you better make sure you get A, B, C in and don't take some, some, some consonants out of it or some vowels out of it. I'm telling you the world is in a mess today because they want to remove the foundation of morality and still end up with a functioning society. It doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. You can't take God out of the equation and expect this life to be a decent life. Oh, come on, come on, come on. But that kid has got to go through a process. The Bible says that though an heir, Galatians 4. It, he does not differ from a slave, even though basically he can own everything. But he's got to be put under governors, tutors. He's got to be treated as one that has, has got to be ordered around. Oh, God, help me here. Help me, help me to put this in the right sufficient language. Because when, when you're at that age, you need the milk of the word. You, you, need, you need the things that are going to keep you growing, motivated, get fat, get all of that, be a happy baby, get spoiled. Come on now. Sometimes we treat new converts with kid gloves. And we should. Don't, I'm going to say it again. Don't you mess with my new converts. They may, they may mess their diapers. But that's my problem, not yours. Now, I appreciate the fact you keep them encouraged and you laugh at them and you play with them and you do all that kind of stuff to make their existence pleasant. But don't you go 
pulling a switch on my, my new converts. I'll pastor my new converts. Are you all with me there? Is, is, this, is this too bland? Is this too basic? I just want to know. Because what happens too many times is we get somebody in and we expect them to walk and understand just like some of you that have been doing it for 25 and 30 years. But you have forgotten how good people were to you as a new convert yourself and how they helped shape your atmosphere so that you could grow. Now what's sad is when we've got 30 and 40 year old babies still expecting their bottles to be fixed and their bottoms to get wiped. There comes a point where you need to become teachers of the word and not just somebody out there wanting the milk of the word. We'll shout, we'll do all that. But if you can't handle an hour-long service uh, or do- message on doctrine, there's something wrong with your attention because you've never disciplined yourself to where you can grow up in the Spirit. If you can't pray more than 10 minutes, if you can't get in there and give yourself to the things of God, if you don't take on responsibility around the house of God, I still remember elder from India, pastor a church of about five or 6,000 people, and he told me, he said the secret is, he said everybody in our church has got a job. Even the kids have got a job. Well, I understood what he said, but you know there's a point where you can't give a two-year-old a job. His job is to just make you smile. That's all it is. Maybe to aggravate you some. But there comes a point where you move from infancy into an older state because you're beginning to pick up and to learn some things because you're no longer that child in that state but you're what what the scripture the greek word is paladon and at that point you are moved up into a different group now you're in school now you're in that stage where you can be told pick up your toys can i preach i'm preaching on sonship I'm talking about relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, I just want to tell you something as mamas and daddies. If you don't teach your children to take on responsibilities when they are five, six, seven, eight years old, you're not going to be able to teach them responsibility when they're 18 years old. If you don't do it now, you're not going to be able to do it then. If you don't start when they're small and begin to build those line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, when they get older, they're going to rebel about what you're trying to put on them then. You can't give them just candy and expect them to have good teeth uh, to eat steak. Thank you. So that the word there is that second stage of, of sonship. It's moving into your childhood. It's moving into that stage where it's a lot of fun, but it seems like it's just school, 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 school. Do you know what the problem is? If you don't keep them active, productively active, the next thing they're going to do, I'm bored. Hello. Because they've got to keep that energy focused because we are moving them from one stage to another stage. In the Greek Roman Uh, I I think it was more the Roman uh, society. They have the concept of adoption. Now, adoption did not only mean that you picked out an orphan from the orphanage that had no father and had no mother, and you brought him into your family because of your 
charity or your compassion towards them. Thank God that there are people that can do that. And I'll promise you, if we had not had biological children, brother and sister Bodie would have adopted kids. We made up our minds years ago we were not going to grow up without children of one sort or another. We would have kids. That's just us. But how did I get off on that? It's just a, it's a natural thing. But when you, when, you are, when you are raising those kids up, you're raising them to move them into adulthood so that they can learn to stand on their own, take care of business on their own, and, and live like that. The third stage is technon, uh, T-E-K-N-O-N, technon. And when you get to there, you are capable of making decisions. The Romans would take their biological kids, put them into school with tutors and governors, and when the kids got to a place that they could prove that they could accept responsibility, they had an adoption ceremony where the father adopted not an unknown kid, not an unknown quantity, quality, but he adopted his own. And he gave his own the seal of authority. The ring was what was usually used then because it was that which they stamped into the wax and made an impression. But they used it as the signature like we do on a check. They literally became sons in authority. When Jesus was there at the bank of the river and the words were said from heaven, this is my beloved son. Those were the words that the, the father would use to announce to the world, I have moved him from childhood into adulthood, and he now has the authority to conduct business in my name. Mm. I'm talking about sonship. I'm talking about maturing in the things of God. I'm talking about when you get to the place where you, your, your life is said and done, there won't be any question. This man, this woman lived for God because they were able to carry a uh, responsibility and were given authority. And listen to me, child of God, if you've gotten to that place and that stage, I beg you, I plead with you, please quit acting like you're a baby that needs all the coddling in the world. But you need to walk in authority. You need to pray with authority. You need to carry responsibility. You shouldn't have to be told everything to do. Somebody help me. Why? Because you are a child of God. Your, your sonship is not just about your parentage. It's not just about the fact that you got into the world. It's the fact that you have proven yourself worthy. Come on. I'm telling you, one of these days, we're going to stand before a throne and the books are going to be open. And those books are going to reveal everything that we have ever done. It's going to reveal the stuff that we have, we have lived at our life. Thank God there's one book where our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And there's some sins that God has taken and washed by his blood. And God has ignored those and covered those. Uh, but there's another book that we're going to be judged out of, and that is the work that we have done and when I stand before God if it doesn't do anything else if this world hasn't gave me any acclaim if this is not what, what, what my name is about as long as my name is in that book and he reads the works that I have done somebody help me preach in this place I want to hear him say well done my good and faithful Let me tell you what's going to happen. He's not going to treat me as a servant anymore. He's not going to treat me as a slave, but he's going to treat me as a son. 
whoo, because at that point I've overcome the things of this world and I've shown myself faithful to him. Praise God. Would you love the Lord with me today? I worship you, Jesus. How important it is, is it that you grow in God? Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to understand something. It's not about just getting your ticket punched and you sitting on a pew for the rest of your life. It's about your function in the kingdom of God. So, Lord, help me until you can say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We're going to have to lose the love affair of the flesh. This flesh is fighting every step of the way. You ever felt like Israel? The whole world's against you. It is. This world wants you to fail. This world doesn't want you to succeed. There are churches right now that are being pulled into court for hate crimes because they have said things that were contrary to the woke agenda going on in this world right now. It's a messed up world we're living in. But somewhere, if I have to, let me stand in that middle of that square and respond like Polycarp did a many years ago. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never failed me. I'm not going to recant now. My God's too, been too good to me for me to ever turn my back on God. Just keep it up. He's watching you. He knows the times that he's had to discipline you. He knows the times he's had to bring correction to you. He knows the times that you've done your best and you've made a mistake. And you've had to trash that one and start all over again. Has anybody ever started a project you couldn't f- fulfill because it's, you made a dumb mistake? You don't quit. You just keep on going. I'm, I'm preaching. I'm preaching to a congregation that the enemy hasn't gotten tired yet of trying to destroy you. And it doesn't even matter how old you are, does it? He's going to keep trying. Because he wants to keep you from the promises of God that you're not Ishmael you're of Isaac and you're not of the first man Adam but you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that quickening spirit You have Jesus. That sounds too trite. But you hear me. You've got God living inside of you. You've got the hope of glory residing inside of you. Now, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, don't make that claim. If you've never spoken in tongues, yielded yourself until you've done that, don't, don't make that claim. Don't put God in that kind of a bind saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm one of yours, I'm one of yours. 
it's going to come a time where he's going to look at some and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. I never established that relationship with you. Oh, God. Now, I know it's, it's hard to even preach this kind of a message in a gender messed up world, gender fluid world. But I don't care if you are a lady. You still need to look for sonship. Because in God, there's no, heaven's not going to have any males or females. It's not going to be anything like that. It's just going to be God his creation and our relationship with him and I want to grow stand with me <laughs> I felt the Holy Ghost so strong this morning thank you for letting listen to me preach I just wonder if anybody wants to come to the altar and spend a little time praying I want you to just come and love on him and tell him thank you Lord for giving me the chance. Thank you for the privilege, God. Let me a part of this. Thank you for trusting me because you knew what I would be long before I ever was. Come on and spend a little time talking to you, the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus.
pastor for preaching such a good message. I believe that he was on target on everything that he said and I appreciate it so much. Amen. Let's come back tonight at 530 expecting a good time in the Holy Ghost and looking forward to pastor preaching again tonight. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Good to see everyone here this morning.